Thank you for joining and welcome to another consultation and discussion for the study of environmental and social risk assessment and management consultations of the Asian Development Bank. This consultation forms part of the stakeholder engagement that supports the safeguard policy review and update process or the SPRU as you may hear us refer to it as. It's nice to see so many new as well as returning colleagues joining and showing interest in the environmental and social risk assessment consultations. My name is Azim Manji. I'm your consultation moderator for this session. This is our 11th thematic consultation topic or theme so far. And this is the second in a series of consultations and discussions on environmental and social risk assessments. In today's consultation, we're joined not only by Bruce Dunn, the director of SDCC in the Asian Development Bank, but also by Ryder Klam and also Charles Deleva, both of whom are internationally recognized specialists in this area. Other experts, including Zara Abbas, Felix Oku and Madhu Gupta are also here and joining in the consultation and will be presenting materials for the discussion as well as responding to feedback. For this second session on the environmental and social risk assessment, we are joined by government stakeholders in South Asia and Central as well as West Asia. We have 63 registrants at last check 49 of whom are stakeholders from outside the ADB network. The breakdown of countries is diverse and represented in South and Central and West Asia region and includes, just to name a few, India, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and some from outside of these regions as well. In addition to these countries, we have an additional four CSO reps also joining the session. For our stakeholders from Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan, a Navroz Mubarak to you all as we celebrate the first day of spring there. In this consultation, Mr. Raidar Kvam will present the main summary issues related to issues associated with the study he has authored on environmental and social risk assessment and the relationship of the study of relevance to the safeguards policy update. From the presentations, we're hoping participants like yourselves will share insights on the potential gaps of the provisions and implementation of the 2009 policy and propose recommendations to ensure the strengthening of the forthcoming or future revised policy. Comments received from this consultation and thereafter will inform the revision of ADB's safeguards policy. Before I call upon our speakers, just a few gentle reminders. As you noted and agreed when joining this session, all stakeholders and participants have consented. ADB is recording this session for the purpose of preparing a summary of the meeting. It is the intention that these recordings will be available to ADB staff and consultants, and then more broadly to all members of this consultation publicly. If you have any concerns about this, please contact the Secretariat at the email address posted in the chat box. Please join from a quiet distraction-free area and please ensure that your microphone is off or muted as it should be right now when not speaking. We can hear some microphones that aren't muted. So please make sure that your microphone is muted and is muted throughout the duration until a moderator calls upon you to turn it back on or unmute yourself and turn your video on. This will happen during the Q&A sessions where you can also ask questions or share comments by typing them into the chat box or raising your hand virtually. Please be respectful to other colleagues joining. Mr. Felix Oku and I will manage time to keep within our schedule. IT support will be provided throughout this consultation. 
and you may ask for IT support by typing your issue or query into the chat box in any of the languages we're using. As we're all joining by Zoom today, here's a few guidance notes when using important buttons on Zoom. Aside from English, we have simultaneous interpretation in Hindi, Russian, and Urdu. To access the simultaneous interpretations feature, click on the globe icon found on the lower part of your screen and select the preferred language. Press the mute original audio button if you're using simultaneous interpretation so you can clearly hear the voice of your interpreter. For those of you listening in Hindi, Russian, or Urdu, if you feel the simultaneous interpretation is too fast or perhaps even too slow, and the interpreter is struggling to match the pace of the English speaker, you can ask the original speaker to slow down or possibly speed up by going to the bottom of the Zoom screen and clicking on the Reactions button. When you've clicked on the Reactions button, you can then press the Slow Down button, which is the two reverse arrows in white, or the Speed Up button, which are the two fast forward arrows in blue. This will let the English speakers know to speed up or slow down accordingly. We also ask that you use your proper name in Zoom for our documentation. To change your name on Zoom, click on the participants button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Then on the right hand side of your screen, look for your own name. Then click on the more button on the right side of your name then click on the rename button where you can type your name, agency, and then click OK. If you wish to send a message, question, or feedback, click on the chat button, and you will see us posting messages in the chat box throughout this consultation. If you wish to comment or raise a question live in the language you prefer, click on the smile icon or the reactions button at the bottom of your Zoom screen and then click on the raise hand emoji. To speak, unmute yourself, click the microphone on through the icon, and to show your video, click on the video icon. We value diverse and informed feedback from our wide range of stakeholders, so let me refer you to the slides on ADB's commitment to meaningful consultations. Just another reminder that these sessions will be recorded and documented and subsequently distributed during and for each event. This allows the ADB to review, consider, and respond to any comments and inputs made. Should you wish to opt out of the recording or the distribution of the recordings, please contact the Secretariat through the email address that appears in the chat box now. If you have any issues or concerns on recording, confidentiality, the potential risks or abuse, or any other kind of discrimination over the course of the consultations, please get in touch with us through the email address on the chat box. In this consultation, we have about two hours. Here's what we have planned to maximize our time as well as yours. First, Mr. Bruce Dunn will provide his welcome remarks. Mr. Dunn is the Director of Safeguards Division in the ADB's Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department. Second, we have Mr. Ryder Kvam, who will share the main issues and findings of the nature and context of the study on environmental and social risk assessments as related to the revision of the Safeguards Policy Statement and its forthcoming update. After this first presentation by Ryder, we will have a brief five minute break and we will resume by the third presentation offered by Ms. Zara Abbas, a principal environmental specialist within the Safeguards Division, Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department. Ms. Abbas will frame the discussion and set the context for the Q&A session on environmental and social risk assessments and the study. Following Zara, we will have a moderated discussion as facilitated by Felix Ni Teti Oku, who is a senior social development specialist, also within the Safeguards Division, 
Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department, who will serve as the Q&A moderator. This will be a session that runs for about 70 minutes, where you may ask questions and share experiences in the chat box in English, Hindi, Russian, or Urdu. You may also discuss your issues, raise comments through raising your hand, as previously explained in the Zoom functions. Felix will prompt us with guide questions to frame the conversation based on Ms. Abbas's presentation. Please then join us for a quick event evaluation before turning you back to Bruce Dunn to give us a wrap up and the next steps following the consultation. As such, and without further ado, I'd like to call upon the director, Mr. Bruce Dunn, for his welcome remarks. Bruce? Thank you very much, Azim. Uh, good day, welcome, and thank you to everyone joining this session today. As Azim mentioned, this is another session for the ADB Safeguard Policy Update, and this is a regional consultation which will focus on environmental and social impact and risk assessment. Now, we are in the 11th thematic consultation session that we've held so far since starting our consultations in November last year. And this is one of about 20 consultation topics that we'll be holding to inform the development of a revised ADB safeguard policy. For many of you that have joined previous sessions, I do want to welcome you back. It's always great to have a continued dialogue with you as we build up uh, this background analysis for the safeguard policy. But for anyone that's joining the session for the first time, I'd just like to give you a bit of brief context on the process. Firstly, just to mention, ADB launched the update of the Safeguard Policy Statement or SPS in August 2020. And this followed an evaluation of the effectiveness of the SPS by ADB's independent evaluation department. That evaluation study recommended that ADB modernize the SPS by building on the evidence from the SPS implementation experience, as well as recent safeguard policy updates of other multilateral financial institutions. Plus they made recommendations that ADB should strengthen its own internal management systems and develop additional guidance, as well as staffing and skills to be able to implement the policy more effectively. The update process is expected to be implemented over about a two and a half year period with the approval of the new policy targeted by March, 2023. And you can find further information on the approach to the policy update, including a background paper and our stakeholder engagement plan through the Safeguard Policy Update and Review webpage. And we'll be placing a link to that in the Zoom call chat in a couple of moments. Now for today's session, as we've mentioned, we're going to be focusing in on ways that we can strengthen environmental and social impact and risk assessment. And this really is a critical area for the policy as it basically sets our understanding of the issues and risks and the need for management processes to be able to guide the rest of the project into implementation. And of course, it also links through to other technical standards such as standards and requirements for areas like biodiversity, pollution prevention and control, health and safety, cultural heritage, as well as involuntary resettlement, indigenous people's safeguards and stakeholder engagement. So this area basically sets the framework and the approach and then links down to all of those other standards. Now, before we go into some of the details and discussions, I wanted to raise four key points really to just set the scene a little bit. My first point is on the scope of risks to be assessed. Now currently the ADB SPS requires the screening and assessment of project related impacts and risks in the context of the project's area of influence. And in practice, the area of influence tends to focus on the primary project sites, as well as any associated facilities, and also considering wider cumulative and induced impacts. However, 
more limited attention is given to the wider context in which the project takes place. For example, a project implemented in a fragile and conflict affected situation, or where there is weak governance and capacity, is likely to present greater challenges and risks and may require additional measures and support to be able to implement it effectively. Thus, we feel that a greater focus on a wider range of risks, including contextual risks and capacity issues, are going to be important for us in the context of the new policy. My second point is in relation to more integrated assessment. ADB currently screens and categorizes projects separately for environment, for involuntary resettlement, and Indigenous people safeguards. And as you'll hear, we're actually one of the only multilateral financial institutions that has this separate assessment process. Now, while of course, it is important for us to consider the detailed issues and risks with each of these areas, we also feel that there is some weakness or perhaps a gap in how we work across environmental and social issues. They tend to be more siloed in the current approaches, and we feel that it's quite important that we look at the risks across the whole spectrum of environmental and social issues and how one area may influence another. So this is my second point. We need to take a more integrated approach in terms of understanding environmental and social issues. My third point is on understanding a project's impacts and risks to vulnerable and disadvantaged individuals and groups. Now the SBS already requires an assessment to examine if disadvantaged or vulnerable individuals and groups are disproportionately affected by a project. And the policy in particular highlights poor people, women and children and indigenous people for more specific attention. However, our experience tells us that more effort is needed to prepare robust social analysis for the project area. And we also need to look more widely at the scope of vulnerable and disadvantaged people to be considered in the context of a specific project. For example, people with disabilities or people from a wide range of different ethnic and cultural backgrounds could be disproportionately at risk in certain project circumstances. And then my fourth and last point is on the need for more adaptive and risk-based management approaches. Now the current policy sets the level of project assessment based on the potential significance of impacts and risks and generally requires impact assessment to be prepared in full before ADB's board will appraise and approve it. So in practice, we tend to be front loaded, requiring assessments to be done regardless of the level of risks and regardless of whether projects detailed designs have been prepared at that stage. Sometimes when we go forward for board approval, we have feasibility studies only, but we're still requiring detailed preparation of all of the safeguard documents, even though there will be things that change at a later stage. And most of our human resources due diligence and appraisal efforts focus on this early stage. And while certainly we need to continue to focus on robust baseline and robust preparation, particularly for projects that have more significant and substantial risks, we also feel that it's important to take a more balanced or risk-based approach, giving some flexibility for projects to undertake further preparation and management across the entire project cycle. So the point here, and we'll come to this during um, more details in the consultation, is that it's not just preparation, but it's actually management of project risks through the entire project cycle that's important. And we need to find more of a balance. And this is actually something that's in keeping with the findings of our independent evaluation department that said we do pretty well in terms of project preparation but much more attention is needed for implementation. So we need to find the right balance here and we 
need to consider carefully how we can get this right. So with those four points, looking at the uh, risk assessment approach, the integration of environmental and social issues on consideration of risks to vulnerable and disadvantaged individuals, and also to more adaptive risk-based management. These are the four points that I wanted to highlight up front. And we're gonna be hearing more details on some of these points through the next presentations. So with that, let me now turn to uh, Mr. Ryder Pham. He is a senior consultant supporting the Asian Development Bank uh, with studies in this area. He is going to be presenting to you some of the experience from other multilateral financial institutions and some of the good practices and approaches that are emerging. And then my colleague, Ms. Zara Abbas from ADB will present a bit more details in terms of some of the considerations that ADB is looking at in this area. We'll then of course be very much looking forward to hearing uh, your views, your questions and comments, and importantly, your recommendations. So thank you once again for joining and let me now turn over to Ryder. Over to you, thank you. Thank you very much, Bruce, and good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon to talk a little bit about risks and uh, opportunities in the assessment process. Um, I'll ask uh, our organizers to please change to the next slide, and I will keep saying next throughout the presentation. So just to say a little bit about the scope and content of this uh, review that we've done. Uh, we've compared ADB's 2009 safeguards policy statement with a number of other multilateral financial institutions. We've looked at the emerging and current good practice in this area. It was conducted as a desk review and it focuses on identifying different risk factors and how best to manage them. Next slide, please. The comparator institutions that we've looked at are the six ones listed here. The Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the World Bank, the International Finance Corporation, which is the private sector part of the World Bank, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the Inter-American Development Bank, and IDB Invest, which is the private sector part of the Inter-American Development Bank Group. And as you will see here, uh, all of these have policy standards and frameworks that are more recent than ADB's current SafeQuest policy statement. Uh, they have all adopted an approach of integrated environmental and social risk management framework. Uh, and they've all based themselves on an architecture which was first established by uh, IFC in 2006 and then updated in 2012. The only exception to that in this group is the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which has an overall architecture that resembles the Asian Development Bank, but it's uh, broader and one might say more modern in scope and content. Our next slide, please. So some of the areas uh, that are emerging when it comes to areas to focus on and that we will try to talk a little bit about in today's session. Uh, as Bruce uh, was saying, we're now looking at a much more integrated and more balanced process of assessing and managing environmental and social issues. Uh, most countries have had legislation for a long time, particularly on environmental impact assessment, the uh, development of social assessment and integrating and balancing this is, a, is more uneven. And international financial institutions have adopted more of a balanced approach to these issues. Um, the, more, the modern frameworks are also um, more focused on expanding uh, stakeholder engagement as an area of focus. Uh, seeing that as an ongoing process 
part of the assessment and management of these issues, analyzing who the stakeholders are that may be affected by a project and who may be involved in and may influence outcomes in the project, looking for a meaningful way of engaging with them throughout the lifetime of a project. There is also much greater clarity now on different and complementary roles of the lending institution and the borrower or the client uh, or the client. Just to say a couple more words about sort of these topics that have emerged in recent years. Uh, we focused a lot, as Bruce said, on pre-approval actions. He called it a front-loaded approach. Uh, and this is true, a lot of focus was on the documentation required to approve projects. This is important, but I think we've come to recognize more and more that risk by definition involves uncertainty. And there has to be some uncertainty because there are unforeseen circumstances, uh, things change, new risks may appear, even during a project's implementation that had not been anticipated before the project was approved. So the assessment process, the monitoring of these issues, uh, that's an ongoing process. And the project needs to adopt a process of what we call ad uh, adaptive management. Multilateral financial institutions have also adjusted and updating how they categorize risks. Uh, as Bruce indicated, it is now looked at in an integrated manner. There's also change in how this has been done in terms of the scales used. The World Bank's environmental and social framework, for example, has moved from a three-tier category A, B, and C for risks to a four-scale approach now, which calls for identifying projects as being of either high, substantial, moderate, or low risk. The advantage of this is that it allows for a more nuanced calibration of effort and efforts and requirements which are proportionate to the project risk levels. And finally, with a greater set of risk factors to assess and manage and the degree of certainty, uncertainty with different projects in different contexts and different countries having different risk profiles, it is also recognized that this requires judgment and flexibility. So experience has shown that a rigid, what you might call, call blueprint approach or simply checking the boxes of different things does not work very well. It does not allow for a sufficiently nuanced approach that can capture and address unique circumstances or combination of risk factors. Next slide, please. So this is an illustration which uh, it's a little bit difficult to read the text and I apologize for that, but the basic principles ought to be quite clear here. It's a three-tiered approach, and this represents the modern policy architectures that multilateral financial institutions uh, are adopting. At the top in blue are aspirational statements. These are the goals, the objectives, the sustainability benefits that projects and activities seek to achieve. Uh, so these go beyond risk management. They focus not just on do no harm, but they focus on do good. And this may be alignment with the sustainable development goals and international conventions, for example, that countries have signed on to. The next level in red, these are the mandatory requirements and they have two key aspects to them. The first on top are the policies and the standards themselves. And below that are procedures and organizational structure. It is something that we have learned that it's useful to separate these two. Organizational structures are very different in different institutions. Um, procedures can vary and can change over time. Uh, but we can align around policies and standards and their key principles, objectives, and expected outcomes. So harmonizing around different issues among different financial institutions and with national country systems 
is easier if we fo focus particularly on the policies and standards within each institution. Of course, there has to then be mandatory procedures and organizational structures, but these do not need to be consistent across different institutions necessarily. It also depends on what type of lending modality and financial instrument we're looking at. There will be a different approach to financial intermediaries, to technical assistance, to uh, policy-based lending, and to investment projects. On the left are the borrower, sorry, on the left are the lending institutions. In this case, the Asia, what the Asian Development Bank is considering, their responsibilities. In this presentation, I'm going to focus on what's on the right-hand side, the risk assessment and management that's a responsibility of the borrower, the government agency involved, or the uh, private sector company, if this is a non-sovereign operations. And at that level, on the client side, the modern architectures have all been built around what was originally piloted and implemented by the International Finance Corporation, IFC. This is a set of several standards, but what they have in common is that standard one acts as an umbrella policy, an umbrella standard. It contains the key principles and objectives of risk assessment and management, and it talks about the management systems, not in detailed organizational terms, but the key principles of having a normative framework, of having the ability to assess and manage risks, of having sufficient staffing, and as of having accountability mechanisms. And we'll get into some more of these details. Finally, the lower tier here in green, these are good practice approaches, guidance notes, handbooks, and so on. Sometimes people think, well, there's a lot of issues here, uh, a lot of different factors to consider. This is true, but there's also a tremendous amount of guidance and handbooks uh, and support, including knowledge and capacity building mechanisms, webinars, and other things that help us achieve the objectives in the principles and policies. So that's a sort of a, the architecture as it is emerging. Uh, and as I said, it's important to keep in mind that this distinguishes clearly between the lender and the borrower or client responsibilities. The lender is uh, responsible for due diligence, oversight of their support operations and of technical assistance and implementation support and guidance to the clients. The clients or borrowers are responsible for designing and implementing pro uh, projects, and that includes this assessment and management of risk factors. Next slide, please. So we found that it is useful to disting distinguish between different types of risk factors uh, and talk a little bit about how they may be somewhat different. They all should be considered in the risk assessment process. But performance standard one that the, these frameworks are uh, based on often distinguishing distinguishes between assessing the risks, that means identifying them, and then management of these risks, which is really about that which is under control, the control and the responsibility of the project itself and the client in this case. So at the top, we have what we're particularly focused on when it comes to the principles of do no harm, the direct and indirect adverse impacts that a project may cause or contribute to. Uh, direct are attributable directly to the project, such as displacement, resettlement caused by the project. Indirect projects may be, for example, cumulative impacts, uh, labor influx that may happen uh, in the context of the project, but where there may be other contributing factors also. So that's what we are concerned with, but these types of issues and risks are affected by a number of other risk factors. So number two here talks about inherent risk factors in different sectors. 
I think Bruce just touched on that. Uh, it's very different to do a large hydro project or a large mining project, extractive industries, than it is, for example, to do a human development project in health or education inherently. Uh, however, different sectors will also have different scales and types of risks depending on other factors. And that's the other aspects here. First of all is the operating environment, which may be vulnerable to adverse impacts. Uh, it could be because it's a fragile environment, biodiversity, hotspots, critical natural habitats, areas with resource depletion, uh, or issues related to climate events. On the social side, it may also affect vulnerable and disadvantaged groups, whether it is gender, ethnicity, disability, or other factors. So if you're operating in the context of more vulnerability, the risks of adverse impacts are going to be higher, and those adverse impacts will be much more severe if they do occur, if they're not avoided or managed appropriately. Fourth, we have something that also, as Bruce alluded to, that we've not always looked at well in the past. We have uh, contextual risk factors. These are risks that the project has not caused or contributed to. They may be historical legacy issues of violence and conflict in a setting, for example. There may be issues of weak governance, it could be corruption, there could be association with abuses committed by third parties that this project is where the project is operating, such as human rights abuses. Uh, the project is not directly responsible for these types of risks, but they will affect how well the project can function and they may exacerbate or make worse the more direct adverse impacts that a project may cause or contribute to. And then finally, we have issues around the capacity and the ability to manage this in an integrated fashion, to identify risks, to avoid them where possible, to minimize or mitigate them, and ultimately for result, residual risks to compensate or offset any adverse impacts. This has to do with management systems. It has to do with overall capacity, resources, and also political will and commitment and agreement on the principles to be addressed. So this is a, a set of risk factors that ought to be looked at in an integrated fashion when we do the risk assessment and management. Could we have the next slide, please? We want to try to uh, illustrate this a little bit. Here is a timeline at the bottom of the slide which is intended to illustrate a typical project cycle from early concept and initiation through a period of preparation, through a period when it's appraised, negotiated, approved by the government and by the board of the Asian Development Bank or other institutions involved. And then it enters into a period of implementation. In the past, as we said, we had many actions done before approval and we didn't always pay enough attention to following through and give implementation support and adjust to changing circumstances, as we said, during implementation. But so the new principles of these frameworks uh, suggest that many implementation actions can be done also during implementation. Additional studies or updated studies, additional consultations with project affected communities, updated mitigation measures, implementation of those, and of course, mon ongoing monitoring and management. So let's try to illustrate this a little bit, because this, the amount of these, the number of these actions, the effort and so on will vary depending on the risk levels. Uh, so click on the next, please. This is meant to illustrate that projects, as I said, may be of low risk, they may be of substantial or high risk, they may be moderate risk. Uh, these are called by different terms in different countries and contexts, uh, but the principles of going from low to high will still apply and ADB and others will need to 
assess this and categorize these risks. This is an ADB responsibility as an ADB has a risk categorization approach, uh, but it's of course done in consultation with the government, with the borrower or with the private sector company, if that's the case. If this is a low risk project, we can click on the next item. Uh, this is meant to illustrate that there are not necessarily that many actions that to be done. This can be very flexible. Uh, most or much of it at least can be done after the project has been approved in a streamlined manner. The level of effort is not very high um, and the sequencing and the fewer actions, as you see, illustrated by the number of balls. In contrast, and let's click on the next. In contrast, a high risk project will require significantly more effort, many more actions, continued engagement during implementation at a very high level. But as you'll see also in this illustration, it's intended to show that there may be more actions required before a project can be approved. They may involve more effort, there may be more time and more cost involved. But this is meant then to be proportionate to the project risk levels. Next slide, please. This is intended just to illustrate what we just talked about. Uh, the types of actions that can be done during implementation and finalized later. It could be finishing a biodiversity assessment to take account of seasonal variations, uh, animal migration patterns, other aspects. It could be updating the stakeholder engagement plan and holding more consultation events in different, at different levels. It could be that we have an overall framework of policies and principles and approaches to address resettlement issues, but we don't have final designs. We don't know where the site-specific impacts are going to be. And so if we have a framework up front, that could be then translated into a specific action plan for particular locations and sites. All of this can be done during implementation if it's done appropriately. And appropriate means basically following a critical path. If we can click on the next, we can do studies and consultations as this indicates. Uh, next, please. That should influence project designs. And I do want to stress this issue. This is a change with more modern approaches to environmental and social risk assessment and management. In the past, these were often dealt with as separate from the main project. Do a mitigation plan for adverse impacts that have been identified. Uh, the idea with a more modern framework is that this becomes an integral part of how the project itself is designed so that environmental and social considerations are factored in along with technical, financial, and other aspects of project design and management. Next, please. Next click. There is a critical path, as I said. Once this has been done and appropriate timing and milestones have been established, we would expect mitigation measures related to uh, compensating, for example, for displacement in cases of resettlement to be undertaken before any civil works start. So these are carefully sequenced and coordinated as a management issue. So if we click on the next, we see this final part of the slide before civil works can start. And integrating that into this whole sequence of events, what we do when will depend on what the issues are. Some risks can be addressed gradually and incrementally. Uh, some risks will need to be dealt with immediately. For example, risks of occupational health and safety or severe health impacts on local communities, for example. Next slide, please. This, uh, this slide is intended to show how an assessment process would work in this case as an, what we call an integrated environmental and social assessment process. And I, again, I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that this has evolved in our thinking. We used to think of EIA, environmental and 
Environmental Impact Assessment, or even ESIA, Environmental and Social Impact Assessment, as a particular study with a particular report published, disclosed as a precondition for approving a project, generally as part of a licensing project process, for example. This is still required, uh, certainly by law in many countries, but from the MFI perspective, we think of these issues now more as an ongoing process rather than just a specific point in time. We think of them as having numerous deliverables, if you like, or milestones and results throughout the project cycle. This would constitute what we've called perhaps an I'll try to illustrate here, an umbrella process, an umbrella methodology. It starts early on with initial screening and scoping. It identifies what the key issues are, and it tells us where we need to do additional specific topic specific studies or action and mitigation plans, such as in relation to resettlement, if that's an issue, or biodiversity management, or a gender-based violence risk situation, how we could address that through a management framework. So this is more of a process than a single study. And you see on the left are some environmental topics, biodiversity, ecosystem services, and others. On the right are just some examples of social topics, such as impacts on indigenous peoples, social inclusion and equity, uh, and other aspects. And there are many of these that overlap and are cross-cutting. Cultural heritage is both a physical issue and a spiritual, often, set of issues like intangible cultural heritage. Uh, environmental impacts may have social risks. People use ecosystem services and natural resources, so impacting the environment impacts people, and people impact the environment. So these are not meant to be separate and looked at in isolation. The process is intended to look at this in an integrated manner. Next slide, please. Just a few words on disadvantaged and vulnerable group as groups. As Bruce said, we're trying to focus a lot more on how projects may affect them. And we can see that they affect vulnerable and disadvantaged groups in at least four different ways. Marginalized groups, poor people and others, uh, situations of large scale inequality on whatever basis it is, uh, may mean that people have less resilience and be may, may be more negatively affected by project impacts, by adverse or negative project impacts. And resettlement, again, is a good example of that. A rich landowner who loses part of the land uh, is not in risk of becoming destitute. They can be compensated, and it's a fairly simple process. Uh, a subsistence marginal farmer, on the other hand, if she's affected and loses her land, she may well become destitute. So it's a high risk level, and it requires more effort to address. Secondly, even if there is no negative impacts, systems and mechanisms of social exclusion, discrimination in the workplace in and among local communities and beneficiaries may prevent some groups from having the same access to project benefits. We sometimes do talk about elite capture, meaning that more powerful groups benefit more than weaker groups in a community or a, in a setting. And so being aware of systemic barriers to accessing project benefits is important. And that could be as simple as ensuring that persons with disabilities have the same access, for example, to infrastructure as uh, other abled persons do. Thirdly, disadvantaged and vulnerable groups generally do not have a high level of influence and their voices may not always be heard and considered. So they may have less ability to participate in the project consultation processes than what other people have, for example. And finally, going above and beyond risk management, point four here is about how development opportunities can be targeted to benefit vulnerable and disadvantaged groups. If we click on the next part of the slide, 
you'll see that uh, we've listed a topic which we call intersectionality. That basically means that different risk factors and social identities do not operate in isolation. Uh, a person can be of a certain gender, gender identity, can be poor, can be indigenous, can speak a minority language, can have a physical or mental disability. All of these can be present in the same individual or the same groups. And these risks overlapping like this can exacerbate project related impacts and make the overall risk factors higher here. So this needs to be taken into account uh, as we do this. The way we do it, and coming back to this as a process, if we can see the next slide, and in the interest of time, I'm not going to dwell on all of these. These are some elements of typical project assessment and management throughout the lifetime of a project from concept and identification through preparation, the approval process, implementation and completion and closure. And it starts out with recognizing the normative framework, agreeing on the principles, having early screening and scoping to identify priority areas, identifying who the stakeholders are, finding the right mechanisms for engaging with them in different ways, identifying opportunities and benefits, identifying specific risk factors of negative environmental and social impacts, establishing baseline data, integrated this, and I'll pause here, integration of environmental and social considerations into the project design and management decisions. So I'll repeat that the environmental and social assessment process is a management process. It requires overall coordination and management by project decision, decision makers. And it's not a separate topic to be dealt with just by the environmental and social specialists. This is established in a project management system and it's implemented throughout the lifetime of the project with appropriate monitoring and adaptive management. Next slide, please. So just to summarize, and this is the last slide, uh, some lessons learned and proposed areas to prioritize for the Asian Development Bank as the institution develops its new integrated framework. Uh, definitely adopting a more integrated and balanced framework, uh, broadening the scope of social issues to be considered, defining the risk assessment and management process as ongoing and iterative rather than just as a point in time and focusing particularly on following through during implementation and balancing the earlier front loading with a great deal more effort on supporting projects and adjusting and adapting to changes during implementation. This is also reflected in how we define the environmental and social assessment process as something that goes on throughout the project's lifetime. So all of this means that different projects, and this is the last point here, is that once we determine what the risk levels and the scale and complexity of the project is, we will target the requirements, the effort needed, the resources, the support, budgets, proportionally with that. Simple projects do not require much, uh, but larger, more complex, higher complex and higher risk projects will require more effort and will be uh, deserving, if I can use that word, of more implementation support, more engagement also from the Asian Development Bank's side. Different multilateral financial institutions are converging around these principles. There's more and more a set of common approaches being used and trying to also align this with national country systems and approaches and support development of capacity. This does require capacity and experience, which is something that we are gaining all of us together as we implement these frameworks. I've gone a couple of minutes over time. I apologize for that, but that is the end of the overview, overview presentations. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Ryder, for the comprehensive presentation and also providing us with clarity and feedback and um, some of the comparative 
processes related to the environmental and social risk assessment study or, or studies, and in particular, the issues related to the four-tier dynamic risk categorization, as well as the suggestion that efforts and requirements be proportionate to project risk and scale and complexity. I'd also like to thank Director Bruce Dunn for framing and contextualizing the discussion. We hope we can get further feedback from you on uh, you, the participants, on what ADB should consider in these general policy topics and areas during the facilitated Q&A session. The session will run for about 70 minutes, as I mentioned before, uh, but there is some flexibility in that. But let's now pause for a five minute break. Before we do, I want you to, I'd like to request you to think about during the break, how uh, the ADB and how we all here can improve the level of engagement and the feedback process and the consultation discourse and um, how we structure these consultations. There's a link that appears in the chat box now to a menti.com survey. And in that survey, you will have an opportunity to provide five or six sentences on how the engagement process can be improved to specifically address your needs and the circumstances and the conditions of this engagement to improve them and to improve the level of participation uh, so that we can all get more out of it, so that we can hear your responses better and feed them back into the revised uh, policy update and how the Q&A can be more structured to have better forms of engagement. So that's for something to think about during the five minute break. When we return, we will have a Q&A session that will be prefaced by Ms. Zara Abbas, who is, the, who is a principal environment specialist within the Safeguards Division the, in the Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department. And Ms. Abbas will frame the discussion and set the context for um, the Q&A session that will uh, resume after her presentation. And that session will be moderated by Felix Ni Tete Oku, who is a senior development specialist, social development specialist, again, within the Safeguards Division, SDSS, um, within the Climate Change, Sustainable Development and Climate Change Depart Department. So with that, we'll pause for a five minute break as you see the timer on your right hand side uh, uh, counts down to zero, you'll know it's time to return to your screens and devices. We will also have some background music playing as the background music fades. That'll be a good indication that you should uh, return to your screen. So with that, let us pause for a five minute break and we'll see you back at your screens within five minutes. Thank you and see you soon.
Thank you all very much and welcome back. Uh, we will now have a framing of the risk-based approach that ADB considers uh, essential or has been proposed by Ryder as presented by Ms. Zara Abbas, a principal environment specialist within the safeguards division. And this context will lead into the environmental and social risk assessment study discussions as facilitated by Felix Ni Tete Oku. Uh, and a welcome to the five NGO reps who were in previous consultations that are attending this afternoon session we understand that some questions have already been uh, presented to uh, Felix via email, and we look forward to a very lively and animated discussion on that. So let's start without any further delay by Ms. Abbas, over to you. And then if you could just hand over directly to Felix Oku, Zara, that would be great. So uh, with that, we'll hear from Zara Abbas. Thank you very much. Thank you, Azim. Good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> so as uh, Azim just explained, I will be um, uh, giving a bit of a background on uh, to help you uh, a little bit in setting the context for the questions that are set out for you to sort of uh, uh, encourage the discussion in a certain direction. So um, um, Ryder just uh, through his presentation um, gave us a, um, a uh, some points and a certain direction that we should consider and uh, on um, the a risk ass assessment and risk management approach. So um, now for ADB to implement an integrated risk management and risk, risk assessment and risk management approach, um, uh, what are the things that we need to look at and how should we proceed? So that's what I'll sort of give a little bit of a background of. So ADB will align with the, adopt, uh, with the approach adopted by uh, comparator MFIs. And, uh, and in that we've identified <clears throat> some areas that require strengthening in order to implement that risk assessment and risk management approach. And um, there are about five uh, uh, areas that we've identified, and I'll just uh, uh, briefly uh, go through those. So it's um, the first is that uh, there is a need for an integrated risk-based classification of projects. Um, there's a need to strengthen environmental and social impact assessment. <clears throat> and to introduce adaptive risk management and in a strengthening safeguards oversight and to have a robust capacity building program <clears throat> for our borrowers and for ADB staff as well. So, <clears throat> so the, uh, now uh, currently, as you are aware, ADB undertakes significance based classification and Bruce has also uh, spoken a little bit about this. Uh, of uh, projects and uh, uh, in this process, uh, the projects are uh, separately uh, uh, classified for environment, IR, uh, environmental resettlement and indigenous people safeguards. And they're assigned as ca category, this categories for environment, IR and IP are done separately. So in the revised uh, policy, uh, we will consider an integrated risk-based classification system in which uh, there'll be one integrated categorization across all safeguards. Uh, and uh, that will be based on the location, nature, scale of impacts, and most importantly, factoring in the borrower's capacity as well as other contextual risks. So this is where the risks come in. And this was what it was just explained by Ryder in a lot of detail. So this approach, as he also said, is now being followed by most of our comparator MFIs. So similarly, as part of uh, uh, this approach for where we're going to classify our projects uh, in a, uh, using a risk assessment approach, we will also need to uh, see how the, the overall environmental assessment process also needs to then um, uh, adapt, be adapted to this approach. And, and in this, what will be uh, what we will do is uh, what we'll need to do rather is to uh, incorporate an approach that considers the linkages between um, environmental uh, and social impacts and risks. So as part of, uh, uh, so the ESIA process, uh, the environmental impact and social impact assessment process, we'll need to focus more on or more attention on uh, the integration of social and environmental uh, uh, interlinkages. 
and also identify how other impacts such as um, for uh, gender and uh, uh, risks faced by disadvantaged and vulnerable groups uh, are uh, incorporated. So in view of these interlinkages, um, I know uh, as presently in, in ADB, we are undertake we do undertake social uh, impact assessments, and um, other uh, processes also happen in which the uh, initial uh, impacts are identified. So this is uh, going to be a process in which these are better integrated with the environmental impacts and um, considered uh, the, uh, how um, these can be uh, they uh, affect each other. So, um, so now in view of these linkages, interlinkages rather, the gui guidance for uh, integrated and social, um, integrated social and environmental impact assessments would also need to be strengthened. Um, next slide, please. So here I will uh, briefly introduce the next steps uh, for the risk man to, uh, that will need to be taken for to introduce a risk management approach. So, uh, so most importantly, to ensure the delivery of safeguards outcomes, ADB will focus on strengthening project implementation as well as supervision. So to implement a risk assessment and management approach, uh, we will need to apply the principle of adaptive uh, risk management. Um, so this uh, involves ongoing monitoring uh, and um, to have the ability to respond to unforeseen circumstances. And linked to this uh, is the need to also develop guidance on how to balance pre-approval requirements with actions that can be undertaken uh, later based on the level of risk during implementation. So um, as um, explained by Ryder, more effort needs will be needed for higher risk projects during due diligence uh, stage, as well as during implementation and closer supervision and tighter management would be required. So uh, based on the nature and risk of the project, um, actions that may be undertaken at a later stage need to be agreed upon with the borrower. Uh, and then reflected as uh, conditions in the legal agreement uh, to ensure implementation. So this is uh, um, being already being followed by, uh, this approach is already being followed by the World Bank and it's uh, uh, um, then firmed up under their environment and social commitment plan at the World Bank. So, <clears throat> So um, while uh, having a new approach uh, uh, is uh, important, uh, um, guidance is very important. So uh, it is uh, equally important to have uh, strengthened uh, ADB safeguards oversight. Um, you know, um, we can the policy can be changed, guidance can be developed, but it's very, very important to have uh, strong and robust systems for. Uh, monitoring uh, and uh, monitoring the risks and, uh, and also managing them. So um, this uh, includes um, uh, appropriate safeguard staffing, uh, uh, a staffing structure, uh, resources, uh, performance indicators um, for tracking and, and performance uh, monitoring tools. So um, recently we've developed and uh, we're also implementing a project performance rating system. Uh, and an integrated safeguards management system for tracking the implementation projects of projects is currently uh, being developed. And uh, by the time the policy revision and update is completed, uh, ADB will also have uh, reviewed and assessed the staffing resources. So um, this will uh, provide the system. So, um, and uh, um, lastly, a comprehensive policy implementation plan will be developed for capacity building and establishing strategic partnerships. Um, this will uh, cater to the needs of all stakeholders, including uh, executing agencies. In this case, where ex executing agencies are managing several projects by, through several other implementing agencies and implementing agencies as well. Uh, contractors, uh, as well as uh, consultants or engineering consultants or supervision consultants who are uh, uh, on the ground looking at the projects. And in addition to that, partnerships with other MFIs will need to be strengthened around um, the standards and their implementation. 
and policy guidance, good practice notes, and other tools for implementation will also be developed. So um, with this background of the topic and uh, how we're considering to incorporate uh, it, I want to do some questions here, which will, are um, coming up on the next slide. And uh, um, so these will help uh, you to uh, sort of help us to guide the discussion in the next session that I will now hand over to Felix in the next slide. This slide shows us those questions. So I'll just hand over to Felix now and Felix can walk you through the questions and open the floor for discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zara, uh, for that uh, uh, background contest to the Q&A uh, session. So I welcome all of you to the question and answer session. I think uh, there's been a lot of talk and presentation from ADB. This is your time uh, to be heard, and this is your platform. So I do encourage all of you to take advantage of it. Um, ADB value your feedback uh, to the whole process. And to make that possible, today's consultation process, uh, we've made available as part of the consultation process, simultaneous translation in three languages in addition to English language. There is simultaneous translation for Russian, um, also in Hindi and then in Urdu. <clears throat> if you want to assess it, you can see the globe button there. You could click on it and you can go into the right translation platform. I reckon some of you may already be in that trans translation platform. Um, in terms of way to get your feedback, you could raise your hand using the reactions button. Um, it's on the bottom right hand corner and raise your hand and we will call you and we really encourage people to um, unmute the microphones and uh, the, the videos and, and speak with us and be part of the, that participatory process going on. You could also put a question in the chat box if that is maybe what do you prefer? Um, and then we'll, we'll follow up. I just also want to ensure, assure all of you that this is going to be an ongoing uh, process to achieve meaningful consultation. So today will not be certainly not the end of the consultation process. Uh, we do have enough time, I think, for us to uh, have a bit more detailed chat. But if we run out of time, there will be email links as well to ensure that you reach out to us and we can bilaterally reach out to you as well. So without much ado, uh, we go into the question and answer time. The order of taking the questions for time management purposes will be, we'll first of all take questions that has been sent to us in advance. Um, unless we note or that the person who sent the um, question is not on the call. Um, we'd like to hear different voices apart from ADB. So then we can go to hands that have been raised or those that have been posted in the chat in the course of this presentation. Um, we'd like to kickstart that process. And uh, I may want to ask if we got Zakir Hussein, Walika, um, if you on the call um, and you would want to maybe hear your voice, would like to hear your voice by, you know, voicing out the question that you've posted here. Zakir, you are from KUIDFC, also you represent KIUWM um, IP, um, Kanataka in India. You you want to call, uh, Zakir? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. If you could just raise your voice a little bit, we'd gladly like to hear if you could just throw back. I think you got two prong questions over there. Over to you, Zakir. It is a it is need to uh, it is need to government should provide the government job to vulnerable families. Yes, jobs to vulnerable families. Yes, that's good one. Uh, you had another uh, second it, question. It is another one. That it's uh, R and R uh, social safeguard and R and R activities. Uh, once included in the uh, project ADB cost. Okay, yeah, I think it's very, very clear. Thank you very much, uh, Zakir, for voicing the question out. Um, two, jobs for the local people. Um, government should provide jobs to the families who lost their, their land as part of um, the project related development. Um, and then the other bit has to do with the cost of resettlement and environmental management. Uh, should be made a compulsory component of the ADB loan uh, in order to achieve better results. 
I will first of all, maybe like to reach out to Madhu to tell us, explain to us how we currently do it in ADB. And then uh, following Madhu Ryder, you could touch on it, um, how the benchmark analytical studies has voiced out um, those findings, how we benchmark against our sister institutions. So first of all, over to you, Madhu. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Zakir, uh, Mr. Zakir Hussain. It, these are very, very important suggestions. And um, it's not that you know these two suggestions are not incorporated currently in ADB projects. In cases where governments have jobs and they are able to offer such opportunities to people, it is normally included in the resettlement planning process. As well as uh, cost of resettlement, we can finance, ADB has the provision to finance, but a lot of the time it really depends on the borrower whether they want to really uh, uh, you know, get loans uh, to pay for land compensation prices. So from ADB side, there are no issues, but a lot of the time we do face uh, that from the client side or the borrower side, there's a kind of, uh, not always do they want to, uh, you know, take that to borrow for the cost of resettlement. But I do understand from a point of view, it actually improves the efficiency of the project it's easier for uh, the, uh, the agency who's implementing the resettlement to find funds you know, to pay for the compensation. Now, how are we trying to improve? Because today's session is on integrated environmental and social uh, impact assessment, right? So currently we screen our projects, but we do it separately. And a lot of the times we just do separately for IR, separately for environment, and we, Although we collaborate to see the interrelationships, but it is important to have a very systematic approach to see all the issues. So in the, for especially uh, for the newer policy, we are really uh, thinking of flagging the issues right away. For example, when we do the screening and classification, it will not be based only on the significance of impact, which means the location, scale, and the nature of the project. We will also assess the borrower's capacity and track record. So um, from that, we can, like for your points that you raised, we can assess, okay, is the government in a position to provide jobs? We already do that, but it can be done in more detail. Then what has been the track record of payment of compensation to people for maybe domestic projects when it comes to land acquisition? If we see that there has been, you know, uh, fund crunches, you know, people are, were, uh, things did not move on time because, you know, one could not pay on time. And we know that if you don't pay people on time and if it's delayed, the cost, you know, it's an incremental cost. It increases, it never gets less. So borrower's capacity, how they're able to implement, what kind of capacity building, you know, is needed. All these things we expect that with the new way, the way we want to actually assess uh, the environmental and management risk, as well as look at in terms of a process, as I think is also mentioned by another um, commentator over here who have mentioned uh, very good suggestions also on IR. I will not answer that. So from the perspective of the newer policy, we are really trying to catch hold of these things uh, at the very beginning of the project, screen projects better and find solutions better. And Hopefully the suggestions that are put here, we will also put as part of the guidance that where there are opportunities for government to provide jobs to families who lost land, it should be provided and that should be uh, looked into. I'll stop here, Felix. Thank you very much, Madhu. That was quite a detailed uh, presentation. If I may go to uh, Ryder there, just on the second question, Ryder, um, replacement, the resettlement costs being integral part of the loan, I mean, typically you tend to have them as counterpart funding uh, from borrowers or client. Um, if we're supposed to push to get them as part of the loan, uh, how do ADB benchmark, um, or is that, the, what was the finding of the benchmarking work with our comparator institutions? And are there any risks to that approach? Well, I think uh, if I understood Madhu correctly, there is no, limitation on this from ADB side. So this can be incorporated. It's a question of agreeing in different settings with the government and the government's preferences on this. 
And that's similar with other multilateral financial institutions also. This can be paid for, uh, not just covered through the loan itself, um, but also there's often pre-approval facilities, uh, available funding to start this process early. The gap analysis that when we looked at across different institutions when it came to involuntary resettlement, uh, didn't really highlight any significant gaps on the ADB policy language side compared with other institutions. Resettlement is one of those areas where we have many, many years of experience and there's been long convergence on this. There are two areas where perhaps greater clarity in the ADB policy language would be of benefit. One is a more explicit prohibition on forced evictions. There are international criteria on what constitutes forced evictions, lack of due process, lack of uh, proper compensation and support, uh, excessive use of force in cases of involuntary settlement, if that happens. The policy language there could be strengthened. Uh, secondly, there is still one of the chal most challenging things we, deals with, we deal with is security of tenure. Uh, there are many different types of land occupancy, as we know, everything from individual private property to communal, traditional, to partial occupancy during a nomadic period. Uh, people occupying, buying uh, urban slums without ownership. Uh, there, I think other institutions have gone a little bit beyond what ADB has in its current policy statement. Um, because there's an explicit provision of security of tenure in the new location, regardless of previous land tenure. This is something the World Bank, the IFC and other institutions have adopted and would be an area to perhaps to look at in the policy update process. Boston, thank you very much, uh, Ryder. Uh, we go to the next um, and we have Mr. Oh, forgive me if that's it's not, it's not male, but we have is uh, Tyru Vitae Salam. Apologies if I'm not getting the pronunciation of your name correct, but you're a Deputy Project Director from CAVSCDP, Tamil Nadu, Water Resources Department, Trinity Region in India. And I think you've thrown a four uh, point question. Uh, it's quite very loaded. So we'll probably maybe want to address this um, in batches. I think the first question and the second would have to go to uh, Madhu. I think the second question we've already addressed. The first question is um, that all PAPs should be, that's all project affected persons uh, should be resettled before commencing the project to avoid delay in completion of project time. That's the first recommendation. The second point we've already talked about it, that's resettlement cost being part of the project loan. Uh, so we'll not touch on that. So Madhu, if you take the first question, and then, um, Madhu, you be followed in turn by Ryder, who would touch on the, on the, on the, on the third question, which says, um, during the implementation of the project, the design variations may be accepted and accountable for the project. So that's project changes uh, during, during uh, implementation. And then the fourth, but not the least, we'll go to Bruce, because it talks about a compensatory afforestation program which should be says in case the space for taking up compensatory afforestation is inadequate in the project area, it may be taking up in neighboring districts. So we, we go via number one, Madhu, that is uh, perhaps being resettled before commencement of project work to prevent delays. Over to you, Madhu. Yes, um, yes. I mean, this is the ideal scenario to have all the project affected people, you know, resettled before uh, the project, you know, commences and everything can be done on time. But in order to resettle PAPs, there are a series of activities that needs to be done up front. I mean, if I have to uh, start civil works, if I can say that, uh, bef and, and before that I have to resettle all the project affected people, there are certain series of activities like screening, I have to categorize, uh, I have to do a a social impact assessment. I have to do a land and inventory assessment. I might have, I have to do a socioeconomic assessment as well, just to see the intersectionality, who the vulnerable groups are, what kind of population groups live there, uh, what are the, what kind of livelihood restoration measures uh, should we have 
what is the capacity of the agency who would implement it, how this coordination will work, what kind of grievance mechanism should be established. So it is possible to do that if we actually work, you know, uh, ahead of time to actually fulfill all these milestones on time. So it is, it's not one off. So that's the reason I think we are trying to emphasize in the new policy update that it's about environmental uh, and social uh, assessment process throughout the project cycle. So like, for example, uh, if you have a road project and you have a length of maybe 100 kilometers, do you need to resettle all these people same time, meaning all along the alignment? all over the 100 kilometers, maybe no. You might do it in batches, but all the activities that I mentioned should be over for the first batch so you're able to resettle people. Now again, resettling people also is quite complicated. It's just, if it is a just matter of minimal impacts, meaning of you just put a little bit of cash compensation and that's it, it's okay. But if you are displacing residential structures, then we have to find relocation sites for them. We have to have adequate stakeholder consultation for the whole process for minimizing impact, for designing uh, the alignment, as well as you know uh, find a location which actually is by their choice. And they also are able to continue with their livelihoods. And if they, are, they cannot, then we have to again rethink of restructuring the livelihood, which can be extremely difficult as well. So what I'm trying to say is that, as uh, my colleague Felix said, it's a very, very loaded point, but it has so many things that needs to be done very systematically. So that's the reason uh, upfront screening, upfront understanding the impacts and risks, and then trying and understand what is achievable is also very, very important you know, considering all the kinds of risk the project setting is in. I'll stop there. Thanks, Felix. Thank you very much, Madhu. Um, we know, let's go to Ryder for the third question. I, uh, project design variations during implementations uh, should be acceptable and uh, should be made accountable to the project. Uh, Ryder, your thoughts? Yeah, I would say that they're not only acceptable, they're necessary because projects always change during implementation. Building on Madhu's example of a road project, I had the, uh, the pleasure of working on major highways and road projects in India, Nepal, and Bangladesh for many years. And uh, one thing we know about that is that final designs are done in stages. You don't do it to, down to the meter of a hundred kilometer long highway project. You do it in phases. And some of those final designs happen during implementation. And the consultation with affected stakeholders, potentially the assessment of environmental and social impacts can mean that you decide to shift the alignment of the road by just one meter to avoid tearing down a school or a temple or whatever it is, or affecting people's homes. So this happens gradually in stages. And it simply means that Yes, there will be updates and variations on the design. This is necessary. And this is also how we integrate attention to these issues through what we call a risk mitigation hierarchy. Identify, minimize, mitigate, compensate for these types of issues. So absolutely, I would say that this is a core element of what we would like to see happen. Thank you very much, Raida. Um, Bruce, uh, it's you turn that um, he would want to know if we can't take afforestation project as comp compensatory afforestation project within the project, project area, then we could do it in neighbor neighboring districts. Are your thoughts on that? Uh, thanks very much for the question. Um, the short answer is in, in many cases, yes, but let me provide a little bit more of an elaboration. Um, firstly, so ADB's current safeguard policy statement doesn't specifically mention the terminology compensatory afforestation, but um, under the policy provisions around biodiversity and sustainable natural resource management, it does talk about uh, biodiversity and also habitats. And, and there we look at critical habitats, natural habitats and modified habitats. And we have specific requirements in relation to each of those. 
when there are impacts, though, the application, normally the, the mitigation hierarchy is applied. So first we seek to avoid, uh, minimize, mitigate, and then offset. So of course, the offsetting part is where the compensatory um, afforestation can come in. Now, really, um, this needs to be assessed, it needs to be planned for, and it depends on the uh, nature and scale of impacts. So if you are dealing with, um, you know, really significant impacts to sensitive habitats, say critical habitats where you've got um, high biodiversity conservation values, maybe endangered or critically endangered species, then of course your plan is going to need to, you know, reflect the scale and magnitude of those impacts and then how you can appropriately offset those is obviously going to have some complexity. How can you ensure the, the outcome of um, a similar level of biodiversity can be ensured. However, if you are um, having an impact to existing modified habitats or planted trees along a roadside, um, then there's a lot more flexibility. So it really depends on, on the nature of the impacts. But um, if I, to, to try and simplify it, if you are dealing with smaller scale, um, low risk types of uh, afforestation type projects, then usually there's not too much issue with finding the right locations. However, if it's significant high biodiversity values, then you know the level of focus and planning and looking at where it is appropriate to implement those is obviously a little bit more complex. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Bruce. Um, I think we, we still got some hand raised and um, this time we call on um, Prakash Engel, Prakash, you're the director, projects, Technogen consultant in India. Are you got your hand raised? You got a floor. If you could just unmute. Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Felix. Uh, this is Prakash Ingole. I was earlier working as a project director and chief engineer in the uh, ADB assisted project in government of Maharashtra PWD. Uh, recently superannuated and uh, I'm now working as director project. So I have some uh, comments and recommendations to make. Uh, while implementing the Asian Development Bank projects, uh, the meaningful consultation is the most important key for any social and environmental to safeguard, uh, you know, uh, to get obtain proper results. So uh, for the meaningful consultation, I suggest that the uh, 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 more consultation with the women should be adopted. Maybe uh, it, it can be to the extent of around 50%. So it's my uh, experience that women generally do not come forward and uh, the, uh, the consultation is not really meaningful. So uh, it should be uh, uh, looked into that, the more uh, participation of the women in the consultation process is there. Secondly, uh, the uh, issue of social and environmental uh, safeguard implementation is uh, uh, the sensitization of the implementation agency staff is necessary. So uh, unless the uh, staff of the implementation agency is sensitized about these uh, two very important aspects, so uh, the implementation is not really good. So a continual training of the uh, implementation agency staff uh, should be included and it should be monitored uh, periodically. Then uh, about the, uh, uh, there should be a program of uh, say trainings for uh, income restoration of the uh, project affected people. And uh, that uh, after the training, whether they are really benefited or not, that should also be monitored after that. Uh, Fourthly, uh, we are talking about the uh, integrated risk-based classification. Uh, so the integrated model should uh, identify the various issues which are mutually exclusive. That means the social uh, issues not affecting the environmental issues and environmental issues not affecting the social issues on one part and also the interdependent issues. And uh, that, that process will uh, help us in uh, uh, preparing a policy about this integrated risk-based classification. 
Then, uh, uh, as far as the environmental safeguards are concerned, uh, I propose that sustainable technology should be adopted and more modern technology, especially in, uh, in projects uh, of construction of roads in which we can uh, make uh, a, a reuse of the material on a uh, larger scale. So means there are, and also we can use uh, make of uh, marginal materials. Then uh, uh, I also suggest that there should be a very robust and continual monitoring system of the social and environmental uh, safeguards by the Asian Development Bank, which the presenters also had talked about it. And uh, lastly, uh, uh, the health and safety plans. Uh, uh, we have we've gone through a phase of this COVID and uh, these are also a very important aspect. So, the health and safety plans should be monitored and uh, at the various levels of uh, implementation by the Asian Development Bank. Uh, so that's all from me. Thanks, Felix. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Prakash. That's quite a very, a very loaded uh, set of questions. So we we'll try and uh, see whether we're able to do justice to the response. Um, first has to do with meaningful consultation and you are proposing that we should have a much more, to achieve meaningful consultation from your experience, we should focus a bit more with women-led meaningful consultation with minimum of 50% at least. Um, then um, on social and environmental safeguards implementation, you think capacity development for EAs, IAs, ADB borrowers is critical. Um, you also highlighted issue on livelihood restoration and enhancement, focusing on income restoration. And you think training and monitoring should also be made mandatory. Um, in terms of the integrated approach that was presented uh, by Ryder, you also mentioned we should look at not just um, in, interdependencies, but look at issues that are also mutually exclusive. That is either environmentally derived social safeguards or social derived environmental safeguards. Then environmental safeguards, you, you mentioned the whole element of sustainability, reuse of material with specific reference to road construction. And then overall, you mentioned also monitoring the need also to monitor health and safety plans. So we would try and cluster them into maybe three boxes. The first one has to do with meaningful consultation um, and uh, women-led or women-focused uh, meaningful consultation that we would um, give to Bruce. Um, and then uh, we come to, there are some social safeguards element, which will go to Madhu. Um, that first of all has to do with livelihood restoration and the need to include income restoration and training. Then we come to monitoring, the whole system of monitoring, the whole issue of capacity. I will take that to uh, also uh, Bruce and then Ryder would, would touch on that as well and also monitoring on health and safety plans. So first of all to Bruce on meaningful consultation and capacity development issues planned. Thank you, Felix. And, and thank you very much to Mr. Prakash, I think it was. Thank you so much. Um, really important and useful set of questions that you put forward. Um, on meaningful consultation, yes, um, couldn't agree with you more. And during the consultations that we ran on stakeholder engagement and meaningful consultation, this came out also very strongly that this is a key area. It also came out in a consultation session that we ran about two weeks ago with our accountability mechanism officers. And what we found is that um, when you do have challenging projects, projects with complaints, it's usually some deficiency in terms of the stakeholder engagement and consultation process. And typically with um, more vulnerable and disadvantaged stakeholders also that may not have been more effectively engaged through the process and, and certainly greater attention is needed for, for women and gender risks through that process. So absolutely agree with you. Um, one point though that I'd like to draw out here as we're talking about um, integrated assessment and also managing risks across the project cycle, um, two things to highlight here. One is that of course, when we're doing consultation, we need to have you know, a good broad understanding of the social issues and the social context. And we need to design culturally appropriate consultations. And when we go forward with those consultations also, um, sometimes we're quite segmented and that makes sense if we're talking to a stakeholder um, 
that might have some limited impacts from involuntary resettlement, but some stakeholders are affected by both environmental impacts and social impacts. And, and we need to be able to present in a coherent way how stakeholders are going to be affected so that they can respond to that. So, um, you know, the consultation processes themselves need to be informed by the social analysis and, and need to be more integrated uh, themselves. So that that's one uh, key issue there. And then also, I would say traditionally, especially in environmental impact assessment, consultation processes are often done maybe once at an early stage when the project was being scoped and then once there was a, a draft final environmental impact assessment. So we go out and basically share information with stakeholders on the project and that's usually before a project is approved. However, what we're seeing from experience is that continuing consultation throughout the entire project cycle, of course, in different ways, but keeping local communities updated, managing grievance redress mechanisms, et cetera, are an important part of the process as well. So, um, you know, I, I think the whole process of stakeholder engagement is something that needs um, a more focused look. So, so thank you again for highlighting that. Um, on the uh, points you made around capacity, um, absolutely agree again. I think there's a lot of work that we will need to do around, um, as you've said, sensitization of implementing agencies, uh, building capacity there at project levels, but also in the rollout of the new policy, we plan to have a uh, program of developing guidance and training materials, electronic learning, uh, running trainings at regional and country levels and through to executing agencies. One of the benefits also of us trying to converge more with other financial institutions is also that we can then work together. And that's something that we have been doing uh, with the World Bank and other agencies um, at regional levels to do things like establish uh, safeguard learning centres or centres of excellence. So these can build capacity locally over time. So that, that's another area that we need to focus on. I'll stop there and pass back to you, Felix. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bruce, for those uh, the responses to those two thought questions. We go maybe to Madhu next. Uh, we go some social safeguards uh, questions prop up, Madhu. Um, live re restoration in the form of income restoration. Uh, critical issue, um, Prakash would like us to do more training and monitoring on it. Um, and uh, yes, um, that will be the one maybe you could touch on, Madhu. Yeah, thanks, Felix. So I think this is a, a very, very important point in, uh, in involuntary resettlement that, you know, with our implementation of the policy, we have been uh, able to get a hold of compensation payments, you know, at replacement costs. But then a lot of the times the issue of livelihood restoration are not properly assessed. And then they are also don't, uh, the programs also don't start on time. And as Bruce mentioned that uh, the stakeholder engagement process uh, uh, is also not continuously done during the project phases. So this leads to a poor planning for livelihood restoration or income restoration, because in order to design a program, you would need to assess the impacts, the risks, the choices of the people, the skill sets of the people, the market uh, demand, you know, what they can do. Uh, so all of this takes time and it has to be planned properly. So I think that proper planning is what we would try to build on uh, in this policy update how and how to go about it. So uh, we have also uh, doing some uh, good practice notes and we are trying to uh, uh, you know, have good practices documented from various ADB projects and some non-ADB projects to see what worked and what did not work. So it, that would also help us guide our, uh, you know, clients and borrowers, you know, how to go about it. In terms of uh, income restoration or livelihood restoration, you know, programs being evaluated, currently as part of resettlement completion process and re resettlement completion reporting, and maybe the last monitoring report when everything is completed, it has to be evaluated. But the problem that we have is 
the requirement maybe is there, but what is needed is more detailed training and how to go about it. And moreover, you can only evaluate if you have a baseline. So a lot of the times the baseline indicators are not there to evaluate. So that becomes a little bit of difficult. So a systematic approach is needed. And I do agree definitely if the a program requires after the assessment that there has to be training, of course there has to be training and all whether the training programs or whatever measures or support we provided to the uh, project affected households, whether that uh, yielded the safeguard outcome that should be evaluated, that goes without that question. And uh, so that's the reason we are trying to, you know, build a lot of these experience that we have learned in this policy update process and also include that in our guidance. And we also have our comparator MFI institutions who also have a lot of guidance on uh, livelihood restoration measures. I'll stop thank you, Philip. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Madhu. Nesta will be right up. I will pick this. Um, is there three string questions? Uh, the first one has to do with if ADB, uh, the, the studies that you did, will have to shift from the front loading into this adaptive management compliance over time, then monitoring is very, very important. Um, how do we strengthen our monitoring systems to ensure that all the plans in the environmental and social management plans, including here reference with health and safety plans are adequately monitored? That's the first one. The second one has to do with, if we're going, uh, Prakash would like, us to focus the integrated approach, not only on interdependencies, risk that are interdependencies, but also ones that are mutually exclusive. I think you made reference to environmentally derived or triggered social safeguards or social safeguard triggered environmental impact. And the last has to do with sustainable use of resources with specific reference to road safety. Three questions, uh, uh, Ryder. Yeah, um, Ryder, Thank you, Felix, and thanks for the, the comments. I, I saw um, a number of these more as comments and suggestions than specific questions. But uh, just to take the monitoring and evaluation, the key element there is really to have this plan of further studies, further consultations, mitigation measures and actions during implementation agreed on when a project is approved and as part of a loan agreement. The World Bank refers to this as a commitment plan, uh, a mutually agreed upon plan. IFC in the private sector refers to it as a, an environmental and social action plan. It's basically the same. And this is what gets monitored against. Uh, the, are the actions being fulfilled in a timely manner? And are the expected results and outcomes achieved? And what we monitor against is the combination, of course, of we do still monitor and check on procedural issues. Are the right things done at the right time? Are they documented well? And we, doc we monitor results. Madhu talked about livelihood rep uh, restoration. This can be a gradual and long-term process. Compensation for lost assets in resettlement happens upfront. But livelihood restoration and retraining people to other opportunities may take months and sometimes years. So this is more a question of monitoring leading indicators over time to see outcomes. One comment linking that with stakeholder engagement and consultation, we've seen very good results from trying to uh, strengthen participatory monitoring, involving local communities in defining relevant indicators to them and being part of the monitoring process. And in high risk circumstances, it may be helpful to think of third party specialists to do independent monitoring and help with that. So that's a lot on uh, the monitoring and evaluation, but primarily monitoring is a management tool for the borrower. It's to look at inputs and immediate outputs and adjust implementation mechanisms throughout. Supervision is done intermittently. Evaluations may only be done once or twice. Full-blown evaluations of this on longer-term term impacts may only be done once or twice in a lifetime of a project. So it's important to distinguish between monitoring, supervision, and evaluations. The uh, capacity building aspects, there have been many good suggestions also in the chat, and I won't elaborate on that. I think ADB has done a, 
a great job in supporting these national resource center centers of excellence. It's something that uh, we're looking to replicate in other institutions I work with in other parts of the world. So ADB has been a leader in this area. Uh, there may be potential for further strengthening of that. But ongoing capacity building is a necessary thing. I am involved in a number of capacity building exercises, for example, sponsored by both in the Inter-American Development Bank and the World Bank. I'm starting today, Monday, my time, uh, with a four-hour training program for implementing agencies in Central America. And this is a one-week-long training program that we're facilitating for them on environmental and social standards. So this is an area, and I totally agree with Bruce, where coordination among multilateral finance institutions can yield a huge benefit. The third question, uh, I'm not quite sure I understood the context of that. Could you? I, yeah, I mean, he was proposing we should, you know, push for sustainable reuse, reuse of materials. I think it was a suggestion, uh, not really a question. I think uh, there were some comments and suggestions there that we've taken note of. I don't think I need to respond to that, if yeah. that's all right. Yeah, that's uh, time, I think, uh, time purpose. I think you've exhausted it. Thank you very much, Raida. Um, next question on IR, I think we have to maybe summarize it because of time purposes. Uh, uh, Madhu, if I could have you on the call. Um, this is from uh, Abhishek Paul, um, independent consultant in India. She says local legislation in India mentioned it Act, uh, Red Claw Act 2013, uh, does not give uh, asset or land uh, as, as a replacement for non-title holders on government land, whereas the ADBSPS you know, promotes that. In such instances, he would push that we include the budget as part of the loan. Um, your, your, your feedback on that? Yeah, I think, uh, I, think I have not seen uh, much of the DMC laws actually would include land compensation for non-title non holders who are actually squatting on government land. Uh, I think the ADB policy, it says that the non-title holders should be compensated for the assets they lost. So which means that the structure or any other improvement that they have made on the land, which they don't own, that should be compensated. It really doesn't say that you have to compensate for land, but if government can allocate land, government should allocate land. But it comes in a different way. For example, if there are a lot of livelihood losses, if there are residential squatters who get displaced, now our policy also requires that you have to establish uh, their living standards and livelihoods if they are vulnerable, as well as for anyone who got displaced. So one of the way actually to re-establish livelihood, if you really take an example of a residential squatter would be to allocate land because that's the best option. Can you imagine where would that household go if they lose the land and where will they go live? They might even go and squat in somebody else's land again or uh, another government land. Now, in terms of including it in the loan, uh, as I said earlier, uh, that ADB has no restriction of not including it in the loan. Um, uh, it's just a matter of negotiation between the borrower and the client, but while at the same time, one also needs to identify who, who these people are, because we also know that when it comes to, uh, uh, you know, occupation of government land, sometimes, you know, the owners also change. So establishing a proper cutoff date, establishing, uh, uh, there are certain processes, assessment, who are the vulnerable households, uh, going into identif identifying them, having ID cards, Assessing valuation, you know, having a valuation survey, all of that process has to be followed in order to ensure that, uh, you know, you also have an adequate budget to pay that. And I don't think ADB will have any issues of not financing it. So, uh, so uh, now I think uh, there was also a mention of, uh, uh, I think Ryder also mentioned that the other MFIs have gone a bit forward and have mentioned strongly about uh, avoidance of forced eviction, as well as uh, security of tenure for these households. So we are not yet sure whether ADB can move towards that direction. It's a matter of, you know, we, we will get this feedback as a matter of consultation process, and we would like to hear more about it. 
that if you go that direction, whether that would be uh, acceptable uh, for our clients or the DMCs to have such a provision in the policy. But that actually brings clarity. And actually that might help uh, making it uh, much more easy for clients and borrowers to request for funds, maybe from ADB for that, for resettling non-title holders. So it's now definitely when we did our assessment, uh, that's one of the things that Ryder mentioned is, uh, has more clarity in the other MFI policies than it has uh, with the ADP policy. I'll stop there. Uh, Alex, and thanks over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Madhu, uh, for those detailed discussion. I think we just come into an end. Uh, we go next, uh, Pratik Wadwa. Uh, Pratik, you are ADB contractor from uh, INRM. Um, so you pretty much know us quite well. You've indicated, you've touched on capacity development. Uh, you said for most practitioners, when we mention the environment, they only think about trees and pollution. And uh, there's a need to um, develop the capacities of uh, these offices or these practitioners to you know, broaden their view of what it means by environmental and social. I think Bruce has touched quite very detailed on the issue of capacity, right? As also touched on not just the addressing the capacity, but in whole in, in implementation mechanism and monitoring requirement um, mechanism as well. So um, I wouldn't, maybe you won't give any more commentary on that, but if, you, if you're not really satisfied, you could, we could get in touch with you and, and deal with that. Uh, we had some advanced questions that were sent to us. Um, one was from Ubaid um, Akramov, who was not on the call. It was more like a suggestion uh, to say, um, he said, we're now, we are on a new transition to the process of evaluating the analysis of the influencing factors on environmental conditions. I want to know what indicators are considered on this topic with the respected uh, sorry, are uh, considered on this topic. Um, I think this is from Akramov. Environmental, they are now evaluating analysis of influencing factors on environmental conditions. Uh, maybe you would rather mind giving a, a brief commentary on this one. They are now on a transition to process of evaluating analysis of influencing factors on environmental conditions and they want to know what indicators are considered on this topic. Not too clear. Yeah, no, I, I'm, tr I'm trying to think of examples. Uh, the uh, you know, indicators would normally be a combination of qualitative and quantitative issues. When it comes to social impacts, we really are talking a lot more about qualitative indicators. Uh, we talk, for example, about if there's been a loss of trust, how do you regain that? And how do you measure regaining of trust through appropriate actions? You talk about power dynamics and relationships in a community and between communities and government, for example. And so there's a lot of lot more of qualitative indicators that have to be very context specific. Uh, environmental issues do lend themselves better to quantifiable and transferable indicators across different settings. So uh, again, it depends on what the risk factors are, what the combination of risk factors are that we're going to try to look at, minimize and manage in a different project setting. And it's not possible to give sort of a checklist of indicators, use these indicators. It really depends on what the setting is, what are the things we're trying to achieve, and then have indicators that on the one hand take account of very robust baseline studies so that we know what the baseline pre-project situation was and what it is we're trying to achieve that's summarized in a commitment or action plan and then monitor quantitatively and qualitatively against that. Uh, but I've seen very, very different uh, indicators used in very different settings and sometimes they're totally unexpected indicators but they're meaningful to the local population, what constitutes value there. I'll give one concrete example, if I if I may. Um, we worked on, an, I know we are short of time, but we worked on a, a renewable energy project in South America, in Colombia, and we thought we had everything planned out and mapped out. And then people complained that the windmills were disturbing the wind 
and the spirits of their ancestors lived in the wind and nobody had been monitoring those impacts and nobody had consulted with the spirits of the ancestors. So you do come up against very, very localized values and cultural perceptions that you need to assess through a good consultation process and a good social analysis to know what it is that you want to monitor against. In this case, we were able to address the concerns of the spirits of the ancestors. Oh, that's uh, I'd like to know about that. That's quite innovative, the uh, writer. Um, the um, we've got. We also want to acknowledge the question from Noshin, but uh, Noshin, I earlier noticed you were not on the call. The question is not too clear, um, but I'll try and maybe answer. Maybe Bruce, you could you could touch on it if 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 uh, if you're happy. He says there is no specific requirement of bank. There is no specific requirement of of bank of dealing desk officer. I think it, there's an officer, uh, but there's a deal officer involvement from executing agency. So, um, in the ESIA risk assessment process, their role is confined to terms of reference provision. I think there's a no objection clearance processing and submission of the ESI report to the bank after quick review. So it, it, it there's no question really attached to it. Maybe probably what. It's purporting to say is that at the borrower side, at the EA side, there is a an officer at the desk review um, a stage, not really offering a value, but reviewing and then submitting the ESI process. Maybe we could, um, because you touched on the capacity development issue, Bruce. Um, it will be our last our last question. Uh, maybe a very brief comment along those lines will help. Not necessarily uh, the case because I can't see a, a specific question on it. Yeah, Felix, I'm not quite sure if the question is relating when it's desk officer, if it's within the project agency, say a project implementation unit, or speaking to the ADB side. Perhaps with that one, as we know, um, Ms. Norshin but she's actually joined many of our consultations and, and made a lot of really good contributions. We can reach out to her and just clarify that one bilaterally. Excellent. That's a good suggestion, Bruce. And we'll keep note of that um, when she joins next uh, to be able to maybe pick it up. Uh, that ends uh, our Q and A session. Um, like to take the opportunity to thank all of you taking time. We just run a little bit five minutes out of time, but really appreciate your feedback. And if you do have any further ones, please don't hesitate to reach out with the email communications with the SPRE team. Thank you very much, and have a nice day. Thank you, Felix, for that. Uh, Ryder, Charles, Bruce. Zara and Madhu, uh, as well as others who work behind the scenes. But of course, a special and huge thanks to you, our participants and informants for raising your insightful comments, the clarity of your questions, the sharing of your experiences, the constructive feedback. And I'd just like to reiterate that the comments on this environmental and social risks that are received from this consultation uh, and thereafter via email will be considered in the final study report, which will in turn inform the revision of ADB standard and updating the safeguards policy statement. But please don't go yet on screen. Uh, please give us your feedback. You will see a Zoom poll question as well as the question that I referred to earlier on uh, mentee.com. But first our Zoom question very quickly, please rank this session uh, based on your level of satisfaction between one and five, five being the most satisfied and one being the least satisfied. If you could just tap in your answer on your keyboard on a scale of one to five, it will allow us to have an understanding of how satisfied you are with today's responses, the um, methodology for engaging you, the responsiveness of our, uh, our speakers and panelists, and how satisfied you are just in general and overall with the level of how this particular session was conducted. It would give us a great response and great opportunity to understand uh, whether or not we met your needs, whether or not we addressed your concerns and how satisfied you are with, with us moving forward with this. So just give us quickly a rank of one to five. We'd be grateful and we'd like to read back the responses so that you can have an indication of how others, how your colleagues felt in terms of uh, their level of satisfaction with this as well. So we'll just wait for you to tap in. And Jennifer, I believe, will close the poll in about five to 10 seconds from now. Um, and then we can go to the mentee poll. The mentee offers you an opportunity to share six or seven 
uh, lines, sentences on how satisfied you were with this particular session. If you could give us constructive feedback and provide us a glimpse of how we can improve the level of engagement with you on Mentee, that would also be appreciated. So with that, um, Jennifer, whenever you're ready, if you could just, ah, uh, oh, right. So 100% said that this uh, session, they would score four or better, which is very encouraging. But we all know that there's still opportunity for improvement. And if you could be specific as to how we could specifically improve the level of engagement with you on the mentee poll, you, uh, that, that option will be available to you up to three hours after this session has closed. We'd be very grateful for that. Thank you all for your feedback and overall participation. I now bring you back to the director of the SDCC and this process, Mr. Bruce Dunn, to give us a summary of what we've heard and to walk us through what the next steps are after this particular consultation. Bruce, could you take us home and review the discussions and our next steps, please? Yes, certainly. Thank you, Azim, and thank you so much to uh, everyone for joining the session today. It's really um, important and useful set of questions and comments. Uh, so I'll just make a brief summary. I, I won't cover all of the points as we have run a little bit over time, but I'll just highlight some of the, the key issues. But firstly, just to summarize, I think in terms of the topic of uh, integrated risk assessment and risk management processes, there was really three main areas that we've talked about. One was strengthening or broadening the risk screening approach. Then secondly, we talked about uh, more integrated environmental and social assessment processes. And then thirdly, looking at how we can develop more flexible but adaptive risk management processes and how they can be implemented across the project to cycle. Um, of course, where necessary based on risk, we still need to focus on baseline assessments and uh, really making sure we've got a thorough understanding of projects and impacts and the design of management plans at an early stage. But then also based on risk, you can move into um, more implementing Im implementation and adaptive management throughout the project cycle. So, those three issues, I think, were at the core of some of the considerations today. Um, we also clarified a bit that ADB at this stage is looking to move towards um, an expanded consideration of risks. We currently focus on the uh, direct and indirect adverse impacts that projects can cause. Uh, we also focus on trying to understand uh, vulnerability and sensitivity in the operating environment for a project, um, including you know, potential impacts to vulnerable and disadvantaged groups um, as a result of the project. But we spoke more about considering also contextual risk factors such as fragility, conflict, violence, governance. Uh, so this you know, broader understanding of, um, you might say inherent risks or contextual factors in the project area are also very important, along with understanding uh, performance related risks, such as the management systems capacity and resources. So these were some of the um, core issues. And we certainly highlighted the need to start early, screen and assess projects and risks at, at an early stage and keep that under review throughout the project cycle. Um, but in addition to these issues, there were a number of other important topics that were raised today. We had quite a few uh, issues raised about involuntary resettlement, um, and I won't go into details here, but um, topics such as the cost of resettlement, the timing of compensation, and compensation arrangements for non-title holders were, were all touched on. Um, and it was also mentioned by uh, Mr. Ryder that generally for involuntary resettlement, ADB is quite well aligned um, with the body of practice and policies from other multilateral development banks. But a couple of areas that were mentioned where we could potentially strengthen was on more explicit prohibition on forced evictions uh, and also explicit consideration of the security of tenure of people in uh, new relocation areas. Uh, so th that was a number of points on involuntary resettlement. Uh, also raised was the importance of strengthening meaningful consultation. 
also you know very critical to to this entire process and to our understanding of risks actually uh, to hearing from stakeholders themselves in terms of what other risks that they see to themselves or to the wider project um, and it was mentioned very clearly about the participation of women and, and this is again an area that we think is very important to strengthen of course moving to um, wider process uh, broader safeguards and, uh, you know, I would say a, a more adaptive management, of course, is going to take a, a lot of skills development and capacity. And this was mentioned, the need to uh, build awareness, to sensitize implementation agencies um, and staff uh, to work on building capacities at, at country level, at agency levels, at project levels. And we have some approaches that we use already. Um, and that we can build on, including the development of safeguard learning centers. And we've also mentioned that for the rollout of the new policy, we will be including a fairly comprehensive capacity development and training program. Um, so this is something that we'll need to, to work with each of our countries and, and clients um, over the next couple of years. And, and then really on a continuous basis, because capacity is something that you know, always needs to be continued to focus on. Uh, in addition, there were some discussions around uh, monitoring systems, and, and this is obviously uh, very critical to a adaptive management approach. You need to have um, systematic and regular monitoring processes, and this can be linked more comprehensively to um, what the IFC uses as environmental and social action plans or the World Bank as environmental and social commitment plans. Uh, but of course, there are things that change uh, there are always uh, unanticipated impacts or there is further work to be done on detailed designs during the implementation stage. And this is also something that needs to be factored in more flexibly uh, to try and force uh, detailed assessments at stages when uh, we're still at feasibility study rather than detailed design uh, is not going to be uh, very efficient. But of course, we need to understand the context of risks and then appropriately through the implementation stage, you know, continue to do um, further assessment, management and planning. So I think I've covered quite a number of the key points from today. Apologies if I've missed uh, any of the points. We've certainly though uh, taken note and have recorded the session so that we will be able to capture everything for meeting summaries. And then in due course, we will be taking the information from this session and feeding it back into our further deliberations for the policy development. Then in the second half of this year, uh, we will be coming back to you uh, on the basis of a draft policy where we'll be able to also hear your specific recommendations on the draft. So please stay tuned for that. Uh, some of you will also be interested uh, next week we will be running another series of consultations. The topic next week will be on adapting safeguards to fragile and conflict affected situations and also small island developments, developing states. So that will be certainly relevant uh, to some in the region that we're consulting with today. So we do hope that you can join us for future consultations. And until then, please uh, stay safe. We we'll look forward to meeting you again. Take care, thank you.